Welcome to the Motivated Martial Arts Podcast. Your hosts, Jackson White and Gavin Cook, have been friends and Taekwondo training partners for over 40 years. This podcast will bring you a mixture of their life stories, martial arts, and business experiences to motivate you in life and throughout your martial arts journey. Adding in a mixture of inspiring interviews and some of the best traditional martial artists around today. So over to your hosts, the Motivated Martial Artists. Welcome to the Motivated Martial Artists podcast with me, Gavin Cook. And me, Jackson White. And this evening we've got fellow um, TAGB Taekwondo practitioner, Scott McMillan on the show. So thank you for joining us this evening, Scott. Thanks for having us, having us guys. No, it's good. Good to finally pin you down and get you on. Yeah, most definitely. We, our, our list, we're getting through our list over the pandemic period, which is great because people haven't got an excuse because we asked them, what are you doing? And, you know, we know they're sitting at home. Yeah, but we're, we're all locked down. Can't get home. Yeah. <laughs> so we're getting quite a good bat library at the moment. No, so okay. I'm going to kick off with the, uh, the first question then, Scott. Mm-hmm. And it's really just to give our listeners a bit of an insight into you. Um, right from the early days where you were born, uh, how you grew up, education, uh, what yeah. you did for you in, in your employment, and how I suppose how, ultimately how you got into martial arts. Yeah, well, I suppose it, it goes back to when I was like um, ten. I mean, I was I was born in the west coast of Scotland um, in a place called Kilmarnock. Uh, still, still living here as well. Um, I was there with my two brothers, my sister, my mum, my dad, etc. Uh, my dad died uh, when I was 10. And it was quite a kind of key pivotal point of, of, of my life and the decisions that I possibly made um, back then. Because um, my brother and my sister had left the house. It's me and my twin brother and my mum. So for me, um, and, and this, is, this is a big thing, even to today, um, there was a distinct lack of a, real, a male role model. Sure. Um, my mum decided to take us swimming lessons and all the rest of it. And uh, now keep in mind, I'm 10, so I'm P7, that, that kind of, primary seven rather, at school. Um, and one of the things that I felt with these swimming lessons is that the, the more I went, the stronger I was getting, the more confident I was getting. I could actually feel it. You know, I was just, I, I kind of started to associate exercise with confidence yeah even even back then so did all the swimming thing and tried to play football badly um and my (laughs) (laughs) my my friends uh they were going down to the um, athletics club it was just one night and these were the guys i used to sort of hang about with and and i just i said yeah i'll come down and i went down and i remember my very first night um, there's a, a, a guy called Donald McIntosh, good old Scottish name, you know. Um, and he's, he turned around and said to me, he goes, well, he goes, what do you want to be, a sprinter or middle distance? And I went, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm 13, 14 at the time. He goes, just sprinting tonight. And I just started sprinting and long jumping, enjoying it. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> throughout that career, there was, um, obviously you were growing, but there was, at a certain point, it was probably two or three years down the line, those two gentlemen came down to the, the track. I, I recognised them, but I wasn't quite sure who they were. Um, and it turned out to be uh, Pat McKay and Tommy Burns, good friends of mine to today. And it, it turned out that Pat was getting prepared for, was it the world in the 84, maybe? Um, he was getting prepared for a big competition. Yeah. I can't remember the year. It's long ago. Um, and, and actually, once I start thinking about it, he's probably one of the first martial artists back then to cross train, do sprint training and and his karate. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put money on it, but he must have been one of the first. Um, and I was going through a phase of pulling my hamstring. Um, it turned out as I, as I was growing as a teenager, you know, one leg was growing quicker than the other, so I kept pulling, tearing hamstring. And one of the one of the times he was down, he, he came up and he says, oh, you know, what, what's going on? I said, oh, I pulled my hamstring. He goes, why don't you come down at the karate club? He goes, we, we train there, in, um, I don't know, let's say Tuesday, Thursday, or, or Monday, Wednesday. He goes, it will not be as bad on the hamstring as, as maybe your sprinting will be. And it'll give you time to get back. So um, I went down 
they did a lot of sport karate, surprise, surprise. Um, and I was hooked. That was, I was 15 at the time, maybe. I was, for a while, I was doing, still doing sprinting and, uh, and karate, but that kind of got me into martial arts, um, was, was doing all that. And, um, what, what, what would you say it was then, Scott? What was that? I know it's, I know it's a long time ago now, but you're thinking back. Uh, <laughs> thinking back, what was it that, that really got you hooked, do you think? Um, one, it wasn't as bad on my hamstring. Two, it was just as competitive as my sprinting was and my, my long jumping. Yeah. Um, it was indoors. Uh, so uh, a bonus. Know, especially in Scotland in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it was it was just everything. Um, Pat, my, my, don't I'm taking nothing away from my athletics coach uh, Hugh Robinson. He, he taught me a lot about coaching, um, and, and and that comes up throughout my career. Uh, but so did Pat. Uh, taught me a lot about winning um, and how to win. And, and the mindset that you need. It was just all of that because I was quite competitive. Again, going back to this, you know, the, 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 the training, making me confident. Oh, well, not only could I be confident, I could be skillful as well. Again, making this sort of like small, skinny boy, that little bit more. Um, yeah, just, just a little bit more, I suppose. Um, so I stayed in karate. I, I moved to Shotokan for a, a, a year or two. Um, because Pat had left to, to to take up coaching in Germany, he was he was a coach for the under twenty one team in Germany. Uh, so the club, the Masada, uh, folded. So I went and did some Shotokan for a while, and it was like nineteen ninety. Um, I was uh, in my my local leisure centre, just going to the gym, and I saw a um, Taekwondo competition. And uh, so the gym's upstairs, so you're looking down. And you just saw these people kicking and punching. You go, ooh, I'm going to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, that was that was 1990, that was. Um, the, the instructor then was Pat Marlin. Um, rest his soul. He, he's no longer with us. But um, he had the same ethos as my athletics coach, my, my karate instructor. And, and, and I, just, I just connected with the person, getting back to yeah. people. people. It, it was. It, it had what I wanted at that stage of my life, um, and I just, yeah, I just, I went down for my first lesson just before Christmas, and then started for real after uh, okay. J- January ninety one, and I kind of really never looked back. But Pat left. He was really, really supportive in what I wanted to do and, and my goals, and, and everyone else who had different goals. He was really supportive, uh, but he left for Washington. Okay, ninety-two, ninety-two, um, and Tam, Tam Clark took over. Right. Ta- Tam- just, just, just talk us through then, Scott. Those first classes, because you know certainly I remember back back in in the eighties, nineties, uh, the method of instruction was was very different to what it is today. Mm. So. You know, I, I think it took you know quite a, a a different person to to continue in martial arts above all that repetition and the boredom and the beating yeah. downs and the phys- and it was physical, you know, on your knuckles and all those all those uh, yeah, yeah. crazy things that people used to do. So, what kept you going back? I wanted to succeed. Uh, uh, I suppose it was just uh, that seed of um, want the will to win desire to win, to, to, to be successful in something I've decided to do. Okay. Um, I, I can be quite a bloody-minded character. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd, I'd started winning competitions at Yellow Belt and Green Belt and whatever else, uh, the English and the Scottish and all the rest of it. And I could see as much as the training was hurting because it was, it was hard work. Pat, Pat didn't do an easy class. Um I was, there, 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 was, there was any there was no such thing as easy classes in them days, were there? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was the, this is the way I do it. This is the way you do it, or you're out. That was pretty much the uh, the, the way most instructors were. Oh, yeah, they? yeah, yeah. It was it was this way or that way. You were in, you were out. Um, but I, could, I was seeing I was seeing the the rewards of the hard work and the and just that ethos, that hard work ethic, and. And, and when I reflected, it was the, the people that I've respected previously in my life for coaching me and guiding me had the same ethos. 
It was hard work. Yes, it was repetitive. And I suppose part of my job today is to make sure that I can teach that student the same thing in different ways so that they're not getting bored. And, and that's just today's sort of student, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, that, I mean, as Jackson said, the method of teaching was a lot different. It was just basics, wasn't it? Basics, walking stances, up and down, walking stances, line work, low section block, reverse punch, middle block, reverse punch, over and over, like for an hour. And, you know, and these days, the you know, the sort of, you know, I mean, you know what it's like, you teach lots of kids. Yeah. And, you know, and I, but they'll be like, I'm not doing that. That's boring. You know what I mean? I want to, I want to, I want to play dodgeball. <laughs> but I think back then we were hungry for more than what people are today. Yeah. Um, we we're hungry for that next level, that next whatever. Today it's like, well, you know, we'll see. You'll get a handful that are that are hungry and, and want to train hard. You know, Hazel Bracken, right? Um, and you, the, the, I've got others like her, but you've got the other, other ones that just know that. We quite like it. It's, it's, it's just hard enough, you know. But that's what it is. Yeah, well, yeah, we, we live in a, we, we live in a world of instant gratification now. That's the problem. Isn't yeah, it? you know, yeah. and 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 everyone expects it to come easy and to come fast. Where, as you know, you know, certainly yeah. with martial arts, it's it's a slow burner. It's 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 learning stuff over time, seeping in <laughs> repetition, and you and you've just got yeah. you've got to have that mental mindset to keep up to keep up with it, haven't you? It's, it's, it's a desire, it's a will to, to want to get better. And, and I've seen it in different different arts. It's not just our art. The, the, the people that have reached the top are the ones that are, have that, I suppose, that bloody mind, that desire to, to do what it takes, however boring it is, to reach to reach the top. And um, you, you see it in I mean, modern day UFC fighters and boxers and not even just in the um, martial arts, but in other sports. You know, you, you see in athletics. It's uh, yeah, you, you need that. You need that will to win, that want to go that extra mile in order yeah. to do it. Yeah, definitely. So, when, so when did you uh, when did you get your black your first black belt? Do you do you ever get you get a black belt in karate or was it just uh, taekwondo? No, no, I was, I was uh, purple. Okay. Um, ninety four, April ninety four. I got my first time. Okay. Um, so it's, it still feels like yesterday, actually, but when you start subtracting from today's date, it then starts getting a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> so like, going back to, back, back to the club, what, um, what grade did you start sparring in your club? Oh, because I came from a fighting, karate fighting club, uh-huh. um, I, I think uh, Pat got me sparring... He, he, he let me do some light stuff at white belt, but didn't really get into it until yellow stripe, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But because I knew what I was doing, there was no risk. In, there was minimal risk. I'm not saying there wasn't any risk. There was minimal risk in me getting hurt. Uh, I'm not saying it was great, and not by any sh- way, shape, or form, but I, I knew what I was doing and, and somebody else coming off the street not knowing yeah. about movement and time and distance and kicking and punching. And it was all quite basic stuff, but... First grade, it's, it's kind of how I do it. If, if you've got your, your, your first grade out of the way and you're wanting to do it, then by all means. Okay. And how, how did you take to it? Was, it? was it something you were just naturally good at off, off, the, off the bat? Uh, I, I wasn't naturally flexible. Um, I had to work at that. Uh, I have, although they're getting slower, fast switch muscles. From my, my sprinting, I, I don't know whether I'm, I probably de- developed them through my, my sprinting training. So I had slightly fast switch muscles, and um, did I take to it? No, I, I don't think it was the easiest thing in the world. But again, going back to my determination, I wanted to learn. I needed to, I needed to be, you know, understand this thing, um, and it was it was that, that that just kept me working and moving forward. Um, my desire to understand and be better. I, I knew because I had some friends of mine that were under 23 um, athletes. Uh-huh. It would take years in order to be any good at anything because that's the, you know, it took them years. Um, so I, I knew it was going to take me time and I was prepared to work. So that's how that, that's basically just the attitude I had, I, I suppose. No, that makes sense. So, when did you get into your first comp- first competition? Did you do first competition at early uh, sort of yellow and green belts? 
Yellow, yellow. I, I remember coming away with, I think it was English. Um, and I know I travelled south and, and yellow belt and that big trophy. And it was, it was, yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. There, were, there were big big trophies, big trophies in them days, weren't they? Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it was like that big. <laughs> <laughs> These days it's just medals, eh? Yeah, yeah. it's true. <laughs> I, I suppose for me it was a stepping stone, you know, and you know, knowing what I know now and looking back, you know, you sort of think, right, okay, that could have went either way. I was just lucky on the day. But I learned a lot. Um, I learned a, a great deal because that was my first trip. Winning that, I, it was my first time out of Scotland uh, to compete. And there was like loads of people. It was like, and you're, you're waiting like hours between round one and round two. Or I was just to go on your first fight. I mean, maybe it wasn't. I was kind of felt like that. That's for sure. There was lots of people. I think I think it was. I was in them days because you know the competitions these days are run really, really efficiently. But back in those days, you know, it was. I mean, I mean, we talk about it all the time. You know, there's been there's been times. I'm sure to say it's been the same for you where you've 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 arrived there at sort of six or six, seven o'clock in the morning and you've yeah. not had your, your final fight in the, you've been waiting for the final and it's like half past 10 at night by the time you actually get on and you've warmed up, cooled down, warmed up, cooled down, warmed up, cooled down all day. Yeah. I, no, I always remember that one, one, one trip. I can't remember, from, traveling up from, I think it was from Daventry. We hired the, uh, well, we were loaned the, um, the Daventry Boys Club minibus and it had a restrictor of 45 miles an hour on it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hope really. you remember that, Gav. <laughs> now, I think the competition was up in Bradford, which is probably on a, on a good run now. You can do that in an hour and a half, two hours, can't you? On yeah. the motorway. Yeah. And I always remember um, getting back home, I mean, gone up to Bradford, driven down to Bradford from Daventry, and then back to Coventry from Daventry, which is and in, in, in another 20 miles. And um, we, we didn't get home till two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet it was your dad driving, though, wasn't it? It's probably your dad driving. Was I think he was. Yeah, I was it. Joy. <laughs> that says it all. Then we probably yeah. stopped at every pub on the way home, didn't we? <laughs> Not far off, I don't think. Yeah. But yeah, that's what competitions used to be like. All the finals held at the end, and you know, and, and if you're lucky, you get away by eleven o'clock at night. Yeah, the, the, I remember uh, leaving for Scotland. Who were we? Chippenham. Was that one of them? Probably, yeah. Um, and, and that's that's you know even when you're driving the speed limits in a decent car that's about seven hours from here. Yeah. So we, we had a we had a long trek back. Uh, we, we always do, um, but I think that that's just something that we do to just because we know we're going to get more competition, better competition, and we're, we're prepared to do it. So. Okay. Yeah. So well, that's the yeah. thing. You have to travel, and the thing is. You, mm. As you know, you know, and obviously I know you're you're a big coach up, up up there in Scotland. But you know, again, you've got to you know to get the fighters ready. You need to they need to be fighting again as many good people, the best people in the world, right? Or the best but people in the country, and you have to travel for that. The, the problem is when you're a small pond. Um, use an analogy here. You're, you're kind of fighting the same people, and you get to understand them. And even when you go to a British now. You're still getting the same people, but there's, there's always some fresh faces coming in or there's something changed. So it's not quite the same as it was before. Um, but, but in Scotland, you know the people, you probably have, you know, go to the weekend with the same people that are in your division. You know, it's, it's um, yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? It's going to be interesting when we finally come out of this pandemic and we get back to the the uh, the competition circuit how many new faces is going to be then? How many of the old faces have retired? Yeah, um, or sure. just they've just because obviously you've just been out of training for a year. Well, how you, many really? of the old faces have decided to throw their hat back into the ring? Maybe. It's going to be all change. I, I think the I think going back to attitudes of training, um, I think that's seen a, a, a slip and slide of many. Um, many competitors because mm -hmm. you get the guys that are putting the time and the work and the effort and, and the other guys are just turn up because they think they can do it they think they can do it yeah. um, and, and, and I'm, we're, I'm, I'm, I've noticed it for a while we're seeing a big big uh, increase in that gap I'd be, I'd be surprised if that hadn't stretched increased um, but then you've got the young young bucks coming through the hungry ones yeah. They could close the gap a wee bit, I suppose. Yeah. 
And of course, everyone's had a, a, almost a year to mature, haven't they? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> or a year to get fat, in some cases. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I wasn't looking at you, Scott. I, was, I actually looked at myself. <laughs> uh, oh, bless you, Gem. I really have. Jeez. Anyway, not to worry. Um, no, I've got some, some, some really, really good uh, cadets. And the first fight they get back, they're, they're getting thrown into ladies and men's. Yeah. Um, in fact, you know, one of them who's she, at the Scottish, and granted it's point stop, she was 16 and she was up against the ladies and she beat Vicky. Um, yeah. It's only point, it's point stop, so it's a confidence boost. But she was kind of hoping to have a few more fights before she jumped into the ladies. Yeah. So it's going to be a baptism of fire for a few of them, so... Uh, yeah, you know, with all with all youth, they're quite resilient, aren't they? So, you know, once you get in, I mean, yeah, going back again, always harping on about it. Gav and I, you, when we were fifteen, we used to fight in the juniors division as 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 the, the biggest juniors, and then we'd go and fight in the men's lightweights, you know, and use and use our speed and cunning and guile to try and in not the get same, In the same same competition as well. That's yeah, it. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just another round. Yeah, you know, the adults were a hell of a lot stronger than us, but you know we had a we had a bit of a I think a bit of guile. We were a bit naive and fearless, and that that, that helps. And you know when we got hit, we're like, oh, it just reminded us to keep your guard up a little bit harder. You know, and, and when you're training, I suppose it helped. We always had my dad in the, in the gym who was yeah. uh, in the squad at the time, and he used to just use us as punch bags, didn't he, Gav? To train yeah. So we were we were used to fighting adults. Yeah, it's a good, it's good way to learn. Just yeah. take a few. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of toughens you up to the, the fact that getting a hit is not so bad, really, as long as you're not getting knocked down. That's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. So <laughs> when, did you, when did you get into the, um, the um, full-time instructor side of martial arts then, Scott? Um, How did that come about? Uh, well, it was about 2009. <clears throat> um, I got made redundant from company I was with and um, it obviously I'd, I'd, well it's not obvious I'd separated from from my wife back in 2003-2004 um, to, to get two girls and to, to maintain a job that um, I had I'd need to have moved away and it was not <clears throat> not something I wanted to do um, I'm, I'm very much a family man when it comes down to it and, and they mean a lot to me so I had a couple, well, the solution I came up with was to do what I love as a living and take all the experience I'd gained um, in this sort of like commercial world <coughs> and try, try and make it work. I had the club at the time anyway, because um, that club has been, it's 20 years I've had that now. So um, I just looked at the numbers, did a bit of crunching, knew I'd need to open up other clubs. Uh, I'd need to work and network with the um, sports uh, providers in the communities, which is what I did. And and I just put my head down. I made a plan, put my head down, and just just made it work. Um, so that was, that's about two, that's about eleven years roughly. No, it's two twenty twenty one. Yeah, it'll be about eleven twelve years. Okay. And, and and how did it go once you, once you decided to make that decision to go full time? <clears throat> What were some of the challenges? Um, I think how, how the money was coming in initially, uh, it, was, it was very stodgy because you're used to a salary. So every yes. month. And then when you go full time, it's not like that, um, especially initially. You know, people diff starting at different times and training different amount of times. And, um, and it, took a, it took a few months just for the financial side to settle down anyway. And I could then start to see a plan, um, and 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 how things were were actually going to start working for me. Yeah. So it was, it was, it, was it, it was just maintaining that stability. I had to rejig my thought process and how my money was coming in and how I was paying bills. Yeah. Um, had, had you had you? I know. I know. Obviously, um, you you got your you got made redundant. Had, had you had you got quite a big payout that you was able to put yeah. in the bank and maybe rely on a little bit while you was building the club? Or yeah, yeah, no, I did. I had um, it was a nice it was a nice little wedge. Um, as it turned out, I didn't need to dig into too much of it because yeah. because of the way. Well, firstly, I already had a club, uh, and that was contributing to my my outgoings. 
and then I just started to grow over a few months. Um, so it meant I still had a fair whack of that, uh, you know. Yeah. You, you, didn't, you didn't need to. It's, it's, it's interesting because your story is not dissimilar to mine, really. Um, yeah. because I was in the same position, really. I was, I was working working full-time as a, as a salesman, as, as you were. I'd, I'd started my club off part-time. Um, I'd started my club off part-time. And that was obviously building up nicely. I think I had about a hundred students. I think it was yeah. part time. I remember yeah. thinking, "Gosh, if I if I could double this or even quadruple it, I could, you know, I could easily cover my wage that I'm in my job and yeah. get to do taekwondo full time." So I, um, I mean, I, obviously I didn't get maybe done it, but I managed to save up. I think I saved up about ten thousand pound over a period of time, which I had in the bank. Which I always thought, well, look, if it all goes <laughs> wrong, if it all goes wrong. I can I can at least pay my mortgage for the next for the next year, right? You know that was that was what I kept kept thinking in my mind. But like you, once once you once you make that decision and you make that step, I didn't touch any of that money, you know, because yeah. you just make it work, don't you? You work you you just work hard and you yeah. just make sure that you know you don't need to do that. So, so just out of interest, then. So what were you selling then, Scott? What what sort of products were you selling? Is it cars, yeah. dustbins, electronics? It was electronics. I started off life as a, an electronic engineer. Same oh, as me. Well, no, 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 no. Here we go. Right, we're going to have to end this, this line of conversation. Quick, quick, then. Quick, yeah, quick, quick, hey, we can start, we start, start talking about diodes and semiconductors if you want, Scott. And what about you, Gav? What were you doing? You were with a lift company, weren't you? Yeah, so I was I was with a lift lift company, but it yeah, was just I can imagine it, that was had its ups and downs. Yeah, I was waiting for the joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's trying it's trying to line me up. I can see it in his eyes. I thought I'm not having this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was, uh, electronics is it's a fascinating it's a fascinating field, but um, when I was an engineer, you just didn't get the money. No. So um, the company I was with said because I was I was able to talk to people and communicate. They said, Why don't you go into com- uh, the, the sales side? So I was a commercial engineer. Do you know what we used to say? We say that to some of our engineers now, and that's normally because they're quite bad engineers. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, I'm sure and that's then, not the case in your in your in your instance. <laughs> well, I, I was only in the company about um, a year because I was going through a, like a, I suppose an apprenticeship because I, I just graduated from uni. Right. So they're, they're putting me through, but they were they were looking for sales and then people to go out and generate some sales. Mm-hmm. Um, so put, I remember put them putting me through like course after course after course in sales and marketing. I was up and down to to, to England and all these different courses um, because they wanted wanted me to turn turn me into some sort of selling machine. Yeah. Um, but no, it was it was good. I liked it. I liked the um, it was electronics, so it was like industrial. Ruggedized displays. We worked on some micros and some flat panels. I became the uh, with one of the companies I was the sort of product guru, if you want, in flat panels, LCDs. Um, so they, they were quite new technology at those times. Those yeah, well. yeah. We, 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 I remember a project with um, it was NCR in 1995. I worked for Sharp then, uh, the Japanese mm-hmm. uh, component guys that did TVs and stuff, and. NCR wanted to take a standard flat panel and ruggedize it and have it high bright, something like 20,000 nits. nits. Yeah. So I had to get the, I nearly get confused with my candelas there. Um, <laughs> so they wanted to do, but then there was issues with heat and just being involved in that project. And then when it actually went to manufacture, um, it was, I liked that process from start mm-hmm. to finish. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's, a, there's a, and yeah, for anyone that doesn't, doesn't know the, the types of cells, you know, I think technical sales, engineering type sales, it's it's a world apart, isn't it, from the yeah. selling of a, a car or a commodity product? Yeah. You know, because you're, you're, get, you're constantly getting engaged with the customer, understanding what their requirements are in, in, in technical detail, yeah. understanding what their emotional needs are, and then trying to massage that all the way through to a, a successful sale, which actually, is it a sale? Yes, it is a sale, because they're going to buy something from you, but actually you're, you're helping them realise their requirement and putting the, the right pieces of the puzzle together for them and, and working with them rather than just saying, yeah, this, yeah, this is what it costs. Yeah. yeah. So design yeah. and so you're, you're from your side, you're you're working with them in partnership. Yeah. Sit, just, sit, sitting sitting on the same side of the table, isn't it? Sitting on yeah. the same side of the table with them. Exactly. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, I think I think that's a that's a skill. Certainly, you know, I, I'm a salesperson, Gav is yourself. That's a skill that I've really been able to utilize with my students in mm. in, in martial arts. 
you know, understanding, you know, particularly from the parents, you know, the parents have one view of why they want their children to start the martial art and you get talking to the children. So you, you're not really, although you're, you're dare, I, dare I say, you are selling them, but you're yeah. selling them a, a solution to, to fit what their, their, their challenge is in life. You know, whether that's a confidence challenge, whether it's a fitness challenge, whether they want an activity to, to um, commit yeah. themselves to. So yeah. you, you are, you, you know, and, and dare I say, you're a salesman as a, as a martial arts instructor, or a good martial arts instructor should be a good salesman as well. Yeah, yeah they should be. <laughs> They're not always the case, but they should, yeah. you should be. Because you're, you're, you're selling your, yourself and your mentoring skills, aren't you? And your coaching yeah. skills to people, but you need to understand what their, what their challenges are as well. Yeah, no, it's just... This, this, you know, obviously when I went into my, my first Taekwondo class, I had a particular goal, a particular desire. Um, I, I tried to recognize that in my students when they come in. What do they want to do? Why are they here? And, and sometimes the parents make it easy, you know, it's maybe a single parent family and they're looking for to get the kid out of the house, away from their video games. Um, they want to get them fitter. Um, there's maybe no male role model in, in, in mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah thing for them so there's all these other society-based um goals i suppose goals and factors aren't they influences yeah yeah Yeah. so yeah no it is and you try and understand that this i have seen in the past you know the some instructors will just say yeah yeah it's this this per month and yeah the turn we train twice a week no problem and then there's no there's no investment Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whereas I've always been used to that designing process. Yeah, yeah. I've always had that um, investment in time. Uh, so well, when I when I'm teaching, I, I invest in that student because uh, I know what they want to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's more, the thing is that being, you know, being an instructor and a mentor, it's more than just standing up at the beginning or the front of the class shouting at people, isn't it? You know, that's yeah. that, those 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 days are long gone. You know, like you say, you've got to you've got to spend that time with the with the student and with the parents, understanding what their goals and desires are for that for that martial art. I think that's one of the things, one of the reasons why, just sort of sit thinking this through, just through the conversation, it's one of the reasons why I think some people, when they get to a certain level in Taekwondo, there's, there becomes an, an air, not even just Taekwondo, there's an air of arrogance. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, we're all people, it's just okay I've been involved in it a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've got a little bit more experience to offer. But there's, there's nothing that makes me different from you. No. I, I suspect I mean, one of my favourite quotes is that your, your your instructor has failed more times than you've attempted. Mm. Mm. You know, whether it's you know whether it's in a competition, whether it's in a grade, whether it's yeah. to learn a pattern at a period of time, um, or, or even mentoring a student. You know, because you don't you you know if if you, if you if you're if you're new to teaching and new to coaching. Yeah, you know, you, you you've got to go through that. You, you're going through a new process, aren't you? You're yeah. learning a new skill, and you may not always get it right the first time. And certainly, mm-hmm. you know, there's been times with some of my students where I've done things or coached them in ways I thought, well, actually, that probably wasn't the right way to coach that in hindsight. But as not, I suppose, you know, you, so you do fail some students. Yeah, but you, you can correct that. Correct. Um, it, it, you can correct it the next time you see them. Um, mm-hmm. I, I know, you know, what I've done um, uh, in the past, I just I said, look, I didn't say that right. You know, I'm going to get, you know, I'll get that wrong. I'll, I'll speak to the person one-to-one if I'm involved in coaching them while they're doing what they do on the mats. And, and I'm, all, I'm open, I'm honest. If I've got an, an investment in that person, I, yeah, I screwed up there. Sorry. I didn't quite get that right, uh, over to you in the right way. Or in the yeah. right temperament or in, in the right manner. Yeah, yeah. It happens and it's a learning process, isn't it? Again. Yeah, I've got no qualms about making mistakes. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, you learn from them. Um, it's important. I think making you know, making mistakes and failing, you know, and we again we, we talk about this a lot on the podcast, but you know, it's it's something that you should be proud of. Every time you make a mistake, it should be yes, awesome. I've messed up here, that means I'm getting better. Every, yeah. every time you oh. cock up, every time you fail, every time you, you know, something something disastrous happens and you get over it, you you grow as a person, you grow as an individual, and you, you constantly is putting yourself at that comfort zone all the time to 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 allow yourself to make these mistakes because you know we all you know you've got you've got to try things new things haven't you you've got to make those mistakes and that's how you get better and that's how you yeah. grow as a person. I, I mean, I, I took over. Uh, the, the, the Scottish coaching position in 2007, I had no experience of being a coach. I've, I was 
just finishing being um, a, a fighter of sorts, even though I was, um, I was an instructor. So you, when you're, you're landed with that, you just go, oh, right, okay. What did I do here? So, so what, did, what did you find? So jumping into that role then, Scott, what did you find was your, your, your biggest challenge? Getting to know the fighters, getting to know the nuances of the people I was dealing with, um, understanding uh, what was needed mm -hmm. um, and understanding what I, with my experience, brought to the table. And, and that's where I, 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 I leaned very heavily on my athletics coach, on my, my, my first karate instructor, mm -hmm. on uh, Pat Marlin, and, and some of the things that they used to do. And, and, and I brought in a hard work ethic. I brought in... A, um, you, you know, you you need to focus on your fitness first. Yeah. And then work on, so, 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 brought, so did you did you come to the table with a plan, or did it or did it evolve as you as you introduce yourself to the fighters, understood yeah. their capabilities, what your perceived strengths and weaknesses were with those fighters? Yeah, the, the, the first, first we were talking about mistakes, and you know, I, I made a couple on, on my opening um, some meetings with the guys. Um, I should have just kept my mouth shut and, and, and observed and instead I kind of gave some of them a bit of a platform and I probably shouldn't have. Uh -huh. um, and, but I pulled away from that and I became the observer again because I knew that was a mistake. I really didn't know what I was dealing with. And the problem is when you give someone a chance to talk, they've got an opinion, whether it's a good opinion or a bad opinion, they've got an, they got one. And I was just new into this and I was like, my head's doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and from them, I, I just had to say, well, I'm, I can only be the best I can be, and I learned le leaned quite heavily on my experiences. And uh, Grandmaster Donnelly was very good at supporting as well. So it, it kind of started to take shape. 2008 Cork, moving on, we yeah. did really well. 2010, we got to the, the team final against England. We we're unlucky. Uh, <laughs> I believe right it was the of the coin um, and, and, and from that I started to evolve a lot of my own fighters uh, James Jim, James has been around since uh, 2007 as a kid I suppose but mm -hmm. he was starting to evolve um, and then behind him you obviously had Greg and Steve and, and Alan yeah. was always there Alan Lusk was always there Hazel was starting to come through um so there was a bit of a, from my sort of part of the world, and there was other good fighters across Scotland, Central and, and East, and things just started to take shape, take, um, but probably about 2010 onwards, probably took yeah, shape. I mean, I think as, a, as, a, as an observer, I suppose, you know, you could really see, certainly over the last sort of, sort of five, six, seven years, the Scottish influence growing and the fighters coming through as well you can see them in in the, in the national competitions you know the the scottish squad were looking stronger and stronger all the time um like you say you yeah. talk about james reed and you know and jimmy and you know and a lot of these, lot of these, lot of these fighters that have been around a long time it's almost like i don't know almost like they were just maturing i think yeah yeah no there's definitely a um a latency to it all mm -hmm. uh, almost like probably well, it, like it doesn't just happen does it is what you mentioned before no, no, no. It's... You know, these guys have been in, in the game since they've been 12, 13 years old. Yeah. They go into that period of a cadet and then from a cadet, take those early steps into the adult divisions. Yeah. Some of them can fly very quickly. Others, it takes a little time to, um, I suppose, mature in those divisions, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, James is a crack. I mean, uh, I mean, I did it with the rest. I mean, we, we would drive down and James would do what he had to do and, Invariably, Andrew Deer certainly it was his first kind of nemesis, if you want. And then we'd go up in the car and we'd say, like, well, what was good and what was bad? What do we need to work on? And he was a very, Jim's a very quiet, very kind of deep and he thought, deep thinker, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But it would such, I think I did this, right? And, you know, and there's some things he would tell me, there's other things he'd probably stay quite quiet on. But, uh, we went through that process nearly every competition. What do we do right? What do we do wrong? You know, and, and I'm sure he went through the same questions in his own head. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it helps helps not having to drive down to uh, to Nottingham every Saturday morning as well, probably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did that. I mean, I went, as the Scottish coach, I went down and, and um, took a few down and saw Kenny, and Kenny was uh, very good at offering advice and, you know, uh, pointing me in the right direction. So everyone was really, once I got that position, everyone was, was, was very supportive and, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. No. <coughs> sorry, sorry, Gavin. No, no, gone, gone. I've well, I was going to say. So, who would who would you say were your were, were quite easy to coach? Who who were the fighters of that generation that were quite easy to coach and are quite receptive to your ideas? My students, <laughs> 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 Alan, James, and Hazel. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah. Actually, uh, to, to be fair, Hazel's probably the easiest for obvious reasons. Um, but they were all quite receptive to to, to changing things on the mat uh, and, and making things happen. Um, they trusted me, and, and that's really important. Um, when you've got a national coach who doesn't know the the, 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 the the fighters, the fighter doesn't know what to do because there needs to be trust. There needs to be that inherent, um, yeah, what he's telling me is the right thing I should be doing here, as opposed to, well, I don't really know him. He's asking me to do something I don't normally do. So, so in terms of easy, easier people to coach, my, definitely my my uh, my students. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot now. So who was who was challenging to coach? Jimmy Watson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was he coaching? Was he coachable? Because he's, he's a character, isn't he? He's, he's yeah, yeah, a, a bag of personality and talent. It, you know, he was he was um, definitely on the mat was. Um, clinical was um, he knew what he wanted to do so it didn't really matter what I said he was going to do what he was going to do anyway <laughs> um, and I, did, I didn't really uh, I, I, you know you try things with uh, at squads and he always went away and did his one thing anyway um, but the rest were kind of open and, and, and reasonably receptive um, but you saw it on the mat he was he was very very good on the mat He'd have a very good fighting night you. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. But he's yeah, he was he, well, he didn't get the name Mad Dog for no reason, did he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely top bloke and a top fighter, without a doubt. Yeah, oh absolutely, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. He's a class a very, very good fighter. He's something you'd want in your team. Yeah, um, oh most definitely. You know, and, and that was that was, that was like uh you know, for what since 2008, I suppose, he'd been in the team. So it's just been the past few years. He's not been about. So okay, what, what, what have you planned for when we uh, when we come out of the pandemic then, Scott? What's your, what's your sort of game plan with the uh, with, 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 with your squad members? All oh, right. I think it's all about me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to nail them. They're, they're, they're going to get some some serious training. Beastings, beastings. <laughs> well, uh, we had a session outdoors at a bit of a boot camp session and some sparring drills uh I, I take them out for runs on a friday night so we do 1k multiples of 1k and and sprints and i throw in a few exercises um but they've all said the same it's just you can do as many exercises and as many circuits as you want online yeah. nothing is a substitute for face-to-face -face and outdoor um if your timing just goes doesn't it it's amazing how fast your timing just goes we, we were doing, um, supposed to be non-contact sparring outdoors today. Um, there was supposed to be some distance between them. And um, because you've been doing shadow sparring and you've, you've got the best timing in the world, um, when you got, put someone in front of you, you you're either overcooking it, undercooking it because you're like 10 metres away. Uh, so, yeah, it's just... Uh, so I think uh, I want to try and get the guys, um, get their fitness up and... Just, just get them their time and the movement and distance. I'm, I'm a great believer in those those three things. Uh, just working the, the time and movement and distance. Um, and, and then obviously I've got the other students that want to go through. We've got some guys that submitted their paperwork about what, a year ago for their black belt. So yeah, yeah of course, yeah, yeah, likewise. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's just try, I just want to tidy up loose ends and then start to think forward and plan forward. Because that's what I do. I plan. I'm, I like planning things. What's your, so what? So I suppose so. Obviously, we know what you're going to do with the squad members. What about you? What about your school? Obviously, I'm I'm sure the same as same as me and and most you know and same as Jackson and most martial arts schools that have, we've all been hit quite badly 
because of the pandemic. Um, yeah. I think I think we've been fortunate that we do. Um, it's taekwondo that we do and not judo or jujitsu yeah. because those guys, if we think we've had it bad, they've had it, you know, dreadful, haven't they? You know. Well, they, they've had to develop their own drills. Yes. Solo drills that they've never had before because they've always worked with someone. We've had pat- we've got patterns. Um, yeah. so we can kind of work them and we can watch some shadow sparring and some other bits and bobs we can make a session out of it let's put it that way yeah, uh, yeah. but I'm a, I'm a great believer in uh, partner work I like partner work it, it teaches you more yeah. than, than solo work that's for yeah. sure so but when uh, yeah yeah. when we get out I'm just going to try and tidy up loose ends and hopefully there's, there's things that we can work towards I'm a great believer in putting a, a flag in the sand and, and trying to work yeah. towards yeah, uh, that's what keeps, people, keeps people moving forward, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, on on the positive side, yes, martial the martial arts industry has has had it bad, as has you know all of the fitness industry, I suppose, to a degree. But I think, um, I think when we finally do get back to it, I think it's going to come back with a vengeance. And I, I, you know, all these all these mums and dads that have got their kids that have been you know, at home and on the computers and it's just get them into something. I think martial arts is really going to, really going to push Yeah, I I was talking to James. I I meet up with the guys. I'm I'm not training with them. I meet up with them weekly. And I was talking to James and and James, and I've got to echo this actually, he sees it as an opportunity when we get out of this for for, for martial arts instructors. (laughs) If you use it as an opportunity. Yeah. And, And I've got to agree, I think there is an opportunity there. Um, a big opportunity, I think. Big opportunity. Big opportunity to change, um, maybe change the way you, you run your school because you know what it's like as well. When you when you're in it every day, doing yeah. the day to day stuff, you don't really have that much time to sit back and reflect and look at your school and say, well, actually, you know, maybe I should be doing this a bit, a little bit different. Maybe I should maybe have a few more members of staff and not do everything by myself. Or maybe I should yeah. be in empowering some of the youngsters to be doing more, more classes, but you don't, and it's, it's very easy to go, Oh, you know what? I'll just do it myself. Yeah. Um, and then me and Jackson were talking um, just the other day, just about, you know, the opportunity for apprenticeships in the martial arts world, you know, you know, that, you know, there's, there's so many, there's so many kids out there that, um, like maybe greater, greater martial arts and greater uh-huh. teaching, but maybe not academic. And yeah. it could be an opportunity for them to click. Let's, let's face it, it's a great profession to get into, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. I, I've got, um, you were just talking about bringing kids through. I've got some of these cadets that are heading into being um, uh, adults, if you want, seniors. And, and they're doing degrees at, at their, their university. And, and, and some of the degrees entail them going and coaching and helping out. So they're all black belts. So that's kind of a good start, really. Yeah. Um, so they, they've been coming in and they've been really enjoying it. I'm thinking, ooh. Mm. Yeah, quick, get them, get them, get them before they go and get a job. <laughs> <laughs> I had Alan and I had James and all the rest of them, but they all went and got their own school. The schools, yeah. Like, yeah. All right, okay, we'll start again. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we're coming to the, to the close up, Scott. Yeah. So a couple of questions that we always we, we like to ask our guests and just get a bit of an insight from you. So during the your your martial arts career, what's kept you motivated? The next challenge. Okay. Whatever that is, the next challenge. Um, also, the I, I know what martial arts gave me as a skinny little kid. Um, and it gave me the, the role models that I possibly needed as I was growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you, were, you were seeing people in authority who'd been there, who had done it, who had uh, a very good ethic-based um, way of dealing, way of working. Uh, and, and those kind of, kind of ticked the boxes um, for me. And that's, that's kind of how... I would like to to see myself for that next skinny little kid that comes up and comes through. Yeah, yeah. No, it's and, and you're you're absolutely right. And, and you know, when you when you think back, I mean, for you, me, and Jackson, you know, when you when you look at um, back in those eighties or nineties, and when when we did it, obviously we know what we've done with our lives. But there were people that we grew up with that never got into martial arts who have gone down totally different routes. And I'm yeah. sure you, I'm sure you'll you'll know them as well. You know, friends that you had at school that have 
you know, that have got themselves into all sorts of trouble or whatever. And, you know, it's a lot of it comes down to those opportunities that you were, you were given at those, in those early days, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. How how many times have you heard, oh, I used to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everyone, everyone used to do Taekwondo. I had a penny for every time I heard that. And surprisingly, the, the number of people that actually say to you, I wish my dad or my mum would have pushed mm. me into it and kept me going. Yeah. It's, it's all too easy to give up sometimes when it's hard and parents it's, often yeah, it's, it's, slip into that, that gap. Yeah, the, 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 one of the things that I noticed through the, the pandemic was the amount of supportive parents. You don't tend to see parents too much um, because they come in, they drop the kids off, they'll say hello and uh, if there's yeah. these licenses, they'll, they'll deal with that. Um, but you get, I got to see a lot more of them yeah. Um, they're really, really supportive and really keen in their kids working hard. Most of them are. Yeah. Uh, so that was probably one of the sort of eye openers over this lockdown. But, but I suppose on, on the flip side of that, you also see the ones that actually, you've, you've probably got them, but the ones that surprised you a little bit, the mm. ones that you thought were going to be super, are you know, they're, they're, they're straight away, you know, the, the Drop of a hat. Oh no, that's it. No, we're not doing Zoom. No, we, we, you know, we're giving it up. That's it. And you're thinking, what? You know, you, you're a red belt. Come on. You know, <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, this is what you know. And I, I've sort of, you know, turned around to my lot, and and I've, I've pretty much sort of said, well, look, you know, it's a year. This pandemic's been a year. If you really want to be a black belt, you know, you know, having that perseverance, having that dedication, that that's part of the territory. Yeah. You know, if you can't wait a year, and then maybe. I know it's been a tough time. Don't get me wrong. I know some people have really had it bad, but you yeah. know, you know, it's only a year. And what would take five, six, seven years? It took me seven years to do get my black belt. I think, well, one year out of that, really, you know, it's, it's it nothing. Make that yeah, and you know, it's it's. Um, I think there's there's all sorts of people out there, and, and the ones that you can and you can help are going to benefit from it. The ones that don't want help. Yeah. yeah in the horse to water and can't make it drink is that what they say that's yeah, exactly yeah. the same Scott <clears throat> okay so just final question then Scott what, what advice would you give to a younger you given the experience that you have now then, in, in your martial arts journey um, it's a tough one um, that's, that's why we asked it don't, don't, drink, <laughs> don't drink iron brew <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was something probably a little bit stronger actually. Um, yeah, that's that's tough because I, you know, probably start martial arts earlier. But the thing is, everything that's everything that happens is relative, isn't it? it happens for a while. reason. Yeah, exactly. Um, like I'd probably do the same. There'd be some subtle things that I'd probably change. Um, but I, I, I you know, I. <laughs> Yeah, probably do some other arts. Maybe just sort of blend it with some other arts. Maybe some boxing or okay, yeah. a bit, a bit of di- diversifying. Say that again. A bit of diversity. In, in yeah, yeah. I mean, I've done I've done a little bit of different stuff um, throughout my career, but maybe start that a little bit earlier. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. it's actually but, a really interesting subject because there, there, there's two camps to this. There's the no stick with your one art, and you should get everything you need from your one art. Or there's the the other camp, and I'm firmly in the other camp. Actually, go out, experience not just the arts, but other instructors, other yeah. systems, other styles, and then you can, you know, the, the greatest martial artist in the world, or the most popular, I suppose, Bruce Lee. You know, yeah. He didn't stick with one art. He went out. He sampled. He tried to pull the best of everything, didn't he? It's what he perceived to be the best of everything. Uh, I suppose that's why <coughs> I, I like uh, listening and, and training. I've got a friend of mine who's um, Jimmy Cray. He's, he's one of Ian Abernethy's. Um, instructors and I, tra- I train with Jamie all the time and he, he's ex-judo and he trains with guys that do Jeet Kune Do and all this and, and he's, he's kind of like me he's like you know martial movement is human movement you know it's, it's, it's what's not taught in Taekwondo so I, I'm very much in the camp of there's more to what we do but the answers are elsewhere if that makes sense yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm actually reading a really good book which was recommended to me from one of our uh, previous guests called uh, Ranges all right. Yeah. And it, and it talks about the, the the specialist versus somebody with a wide range of skills. Yeah. And certainly in the society that we're in today, with the, t- uh, the technology advancing so quickly, the specialists they're very much needed, 
but mm -hmm. actually the people that are innovating and things that people that are really changing things and mixing things up and pivoting yeah. are the ones with a wider speciality sorry a yeah. less speciality and a wider breadth of knowledge in different areas it's, it's, it's funny because the more I speak to people outside of Taekwondo, the more answers I see in Taekwondo. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, can, I, can, I can imagine that, yeah. And it's yeah. not just within the art, it's in how you run your business, it's in your coaching. You know, the, the, you know, the England uh, World Cup, uh, Sir Clive Woodward, and if you ever yeah. read his autobiography, he mm. went around the world looking at different sports, to cycling, to judo, to yeah. swimming, to try and gain an advantage, to go and find that one bit of nugget from all those yeah. successful teams that he could then bring back to his sport. Yeah. yeah and and then there we go, we won the World Cup. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, mind, you, mind you, Scotland did well, didn't they? Uh, what, uh, yesterday? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we, we, we didn't do too badly. There's, it's about time. We, we made too many mistakes in the previous two games after a good... Win against England. Yeah, well, no, no, right. <laughs> pretty where credit is due. <laughs> no, we've had a poor season this year. Poor season. I, I, I was I was watching England, and it's. <laughs> I think you've got some very very good players. It's I, I I don't know the system. I'm not seeing the system that England of old used to have. Mm. You'd, you'd see the system. It would be really 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 hard to beat. Um, but the, 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 the Irish played well. It's bringing yeah. in new players, changing the system. To which people aren't 100 percent comfortable with, it. and it's I suppose trying to get people ready for the World Cup in two years. Yeah, so, and I think so. I'm not overly, overly concerned that we haven't finished no. in a great position because actually the, the the aim is the World Cup, isn't it? I, I think if that's the goal, then it's, it's what he's got is a platform. Correct. Yeah. Um, he needs to move on from there. How he does it, we'll, we'll see in due course, I suppose. Oh, hopefully, he's got a plan. Right, Scott, we're, we're going to have to call it to a close there. It's been an absolute fantastic pleasure having you on and a real insight this evening. Yeah, good catching up with you guys. On, on the coaching side, really, really fascinating. Yeah, brilliant. Really good. No, thank you. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, thank you. Good. Okay, thanks, thanks Scott. Thanks, Scott. Right. See you later. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. I hope you all enjoyed this week's episode of the Motivated Martial Artist podcast. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page and our Facebook group, the Motivated Martial Artist podcast. And don't forget also the Motivated Martial Artist Instagram page. So head along for some extra content, interviews and much more. So until next week, it's bye from Jackson and Gavin, the Motivated Martial Artists.